Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, after having listened to that pyrotechnically brilliant lecture, I can only begin by recalling a few sentences in William Shakespeare's Richard III. As in a theater, when a well-graced actor leaves the stage, the eyes of men are idly bent on him that enters next, thinking, <laughs> thinking his prattle to be tedious. Well, I hope it will not be tedious. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this question, which was put to me by Bank Norden, is a very important one. The chemist, the chemical engineer, and the biotechnologist will answer, yes, of course, but in the fullness of time. The concerned environmentalists and members of the general public, and maybe some politicians, will say yes and as soon as possible. Indeed, many political decisions may accelerate the arrival of clean technology and sustainability. Now, what do we mean? Before we go any further, before we understand fully what we have to address, let me remind you of the variety of materials and commodities that civilized life depends upon, pretty well all of which are generated as a, through the agency of catalysts. Fuel, fuels for heating and for transport, fabrics, fertilizers, flavors, fragrances, pharmaceuticals, forms, and a multiplicity of other things. I mean, sun creams, detergents, surfactants, the, uh, the list is almost endless. Now, the task, therefore, for the responsible, ecologically and environmentally responsible chemist of the future is to design ways of using materials that are renewable, that we have to be able to use the plant kingdom, vegetable oil, and various other materials that grow, timber, wood, etc. Um, grass, for example, cellulosic material. And what do we mean by clean technology? That means that in future we have to frown, if not forbid, the use of things like nitric acid or permanganate or chromates for oxidizing because these are usually stoichiometric. They contribute an oxygen atom and then they leave some byproduct which is usually deleterious, nitrous gas, nitrogenous gases or CO2 or materials that have to be put into landfills or are toxic. So that's one kind of step that one has to take in introducing the era of clean technology. Another is to avoid solvents wherever possible. Another is to carry out reactions which lead to only one product, no byproducts. Or if they're byproducts, they're benign, like water. If you're using an oxidant, don't use nitric acid, as I was just telling you. Use oxygen or air or H2O2 or a step a little further, any alkyl hydroperoxide, because the products there are pretty benign. Also, you need to have to design systems whereby you carry out a sequence of reactions in one pot, so to speak, a cascade, uh, a, a sequence such that you don't have to separate much of the energy and the cost in manufacture of chemical materials comes from separation, and you can avoid that. Also, you talk about what is known as a 100% atom econ economic process. That means to say, if you have two species, A and B, and you're producing a product, C, all the atoms in the reactants end up in the desirable product. So those are the things that we need to bear in mind. Now, this you might say, is a daunting task. Indeed, many, many professional industrial chemists say it's a pipe dream. You have to wait many generations before you will get this. 
But that can't be so. I mean, societal pressure alone will demand that these problems are solved. Now, just before I enter properly into this discussion, let me remind you of a speech made by this gentleman, Sir William Crookes, of Crookes Tube fame, the man who discovered thallium. He was president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. And in 1898, he made a dire statement to the general public in Britain, pointing out that because there was such an acute shortage of fertilizer, nitrogenous fertilizer, mankind faced starvation worldwide, unless something pretty drastic was done to find a way of replenishing the nitrogenous materials in soil. Mercifully, 13 years later, in Karlsruhe in Germany, Fritz Haber discovers how to make ammonia. Ammonia is now produced on a massive scale, about 150 million tons per annum, and the number is continuing to grow. And we can't live without it. Now, this picture, which when I showed it to my Egyptian wife, she thought it was a pharaonic necklace. <laughs> Not at all. This is the tree trunk from uh, a Norwegian forest. And it tells you in a very striking, dramatic way. It's been growing for 35 years. Nitrogenous fertilizer was administered annually from the air after about 25 years. Need I say any more? Look at the magnitude of the girth that has been produced as a result of administrating ammonia. Now, the ammonia synthesis catalyst is an extremely efficient process. The BASF company, which is the largest manufacturer in the world, uses very largely the iron of the kind that Fritz Haber took from a Swedish mine, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Jellivo, is it Jellivo? Which was magnetite, but it had a tincture of calcium and aluminium, adventitious impurities, and they turned out to be extremely important in stabilizing the area of the iron that you use for the conversion of nitrogen and hydrogen to ammonia. In fact, it waited something like 80 years since the invention of the catalyst before we could fully understand how it worked. And it was Gerhard Ertel in Germany who explained it all. This is, you don't need to know or even remember the precise numbers involved here, just observe that you have nitrogen atoms and hydrogen atoms. You have to dissociate the nitrogen molecule. That's the main function of the iron catalyst. But also, the intermediates that are formed on the surface, the hydrogen atoms and the NH and NH2 groups mustn't adhere too strongly to the substratum. They've got to migrate and coalesce and form the ammonia gas. Now, that is the essence of what is arguably one of the single most important heterogeneous catalytic reactions that mankind has ever evolved. The efficiency is just extraordinary. You can put in this catalyst and it lasts for 15 years before you have to replenish it, which is remarkable. And there's a turnover of about two molecules per second at, the, at each active site. Now, almost as important industrially is the synthesis of methanol. Methanol is made from a mixture of hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and CO2. Most of the carbon in the methanol comes from the CO2, not from the CO. It's an extremely interesting reaction, and it's one that is still argued about so far as its mechanism is concerned. On May the 10th of this year, in the journal Science, a large group, and I'll come to their names in a moment, talked about the way in which this catalyst works. It was, the catalyst was invented in ICI in Britain, and it consists of copper, 
on zinc oxide, which on turn is supported on alumina. Now, already you can see that the complexity of preparation involved in heterogeneous catalysis is generally higher than that in, shall we say, homogeneous catalysis. And it's very difficult to work out precisely the mechanism. And yet that's what you need if you're going to sustain its activity and seal activity and its longevity. You need to have a strong attrition-resistant catalyst. You, all those things have to be maximized for a good industrial catalyst. Now there is talk in many quarters of the methanol economy. If and when we succeed in getting plenty of hydrogen, maybe from solar energy, then indeed this carbon cycle would be a very, very good one because you can store chemical energy in the methanol. You can use the methanol too to prepare formaldehyde and formaldehyde is used to make artificial wood. Probably much of the material that is used in most buildings these days comes from methanol or formaldehyde urea and so forth. Now, this is the paper that appeared on May the 10th. It's a group from Schlegel, who was formerly worked with me in Cambridge. What it appears likely is the active site. This is still an enigma. It's still controversial. But this is probably one of the most convincing arguments that one has seen up until now. You have a flat copper surface, but it has defects in it, these twin boundaries. And at the edge of a twin boundary, you have a step. And that's where minute quantities of zinc reside. And they, it seems from this very clever work that uh, Jens Norskov, now in Stanford, formerly of Copenhagen, has done to interpret this mechanism. Now, I'm putting onto this screen something from the patent literature, which I don't normally read. But I have friends in industry. And this particular one caught my eye, not only because I shall be saying quite a bit about zeolite catalysts, and zeolites were first discovered in Sweden as long ago as 1756. Zeolitic catalysts are extremely important. In fact, every gallon, or sorry, every liter of gasoline that you use passes through a lanthanum zeolite Y catalyst catalytic cracking, and indeed many other preparations like that of ethylene. 110 million tons of ethylene are produced every year because you need polythene for packaging and so forth. Now, here's a key message. One of the outstanding physical attributes of commercial catalysts is hardness, i.e. ability to resist attrition. Literally thousands of new catalysts appear every year. There's a journal, well, there are about 20 journals dealing with catalysis. And many of those catalysts are capable of converting, say, five molecules per second and then they die. Or it may be 50 million molecules per hour and then they die. But as I was telling you earlier, the iron synthesis catalyst lasts for 15 years and is tremendously durable. Now here, is the first example of a series that I'm going to show you of solid acid catalysts, which are open structure solids. We are going to hear a lot in these two days about nanoscience, uh, nanoparticles. I'm dealing mainly with nanospaces, zeolitic and other nanoporous solids, of which there are now very many, rapidly expanding ones. You can understand how they work. You know, there are millions of tons of liquid acid being used, sometimes in a profligate way in industry, and in a dangerous way, and in a corrosive and sometimes toxic way. If you use a solid acid, now this one, zeolite theta, it was discovered by a former student of mine a few weeks after he joined the British Petroleum Company, and it was very, very important for a short period of time, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But it illustrates a very nice, simple fact, which we can all understand. It facilitates the isomerization of an alkene. A Brunsted solid acid catalyst. It picks up a proton. These are the loosely, loosely attached protons. It forms an intermediate. They rearrange 
quantum mechanics tells you exactly which way it's going to rearrange in the presence of a particular solid, and it produces this molecule which was first discovered by Michael Faraday, and I was very pleased as one of Faraday's successors in the Royal Institution to hear your president talk about Michael Faraday. Not only did he give that wonderful answer, he also gave another answer when he discovered electromagnetic induction. When another politician asked him, of what use is this? And he gave Benjamin Franklin's immortal reply, of what use is a newborn child? Which is a beautiful answer to a very polemical question. So now, here's a solid acid catalyst of just one type. Here's another. This is a very, very popular one. It was invented in the Mobil company. It's called ZSM5, Zeolite Soconi Mobil, but is widely used. And here's the image in the electron microscope. Here's the sort of color drawing, and each time you replace a silicon with an aluminum, you generate a loosely attached proton. And you can titrate how many protons are there by using pyridine. And indeed, if you do that and do it judiciously, you can measure the heat liberated, and you find that the heat remains constant until you saturate and use up all those active sites, which tells you, therefore, that each one of those sites is energetically similar. It's a single site heterogeneous catalyst which is one of the areas that I've been working on. Now, these solids can dehydrate. Just imagine, put in ethanol, alcohol, ordinary alcohol. Put it into a solid acid. It'll pick up a proton, and you have OH2+. Plus. Now, that H2O can drop off, but the residual is C2H5+. Plus. That proton has to be given back to the acid, and you end up with ethylene. And that's how you prepare ethylene. It used to be, in my school days, concentrated sulfuric acid was needed to prepare ethylene. But you can prepare ethylene from these catalysts very easily. And that's not a trivial statement. The economy of Brazil is greatly dependent on the ease with which it can produce ethanol. And consequently, not only does it use ethanol for fuel, it can generate ethylene by dehydration, and ethylene gives it its polythene and so forth. But there are also other reactions. I've mentioned isomerization. Alkylation, you can add another molecule, say, to benzene. You can put ethylene on benzene and form ethyl benzene, and that will give you, in turn, styrene, and then you have a new polymer. So these are important examples of nanoporous single-site catalysts. Now, there's a group in Mülheim in Germany, in the Max Planck Institute, led by a gentleman named Ferdi Schutt, who has been doing some very clever work in using the superabundantly available glycerol. Glycerol, here it is, is generated from these triglycerides. You can either use an alcohol or a sodium hydroxide, and you can produce these fatty acid methyl esters, which is biodiesel, and a superabundance of glycerol. So now one of the challenges facing the molecular frontiers that we belong to is to utilize that glycerol so as to generate important chemical building blocks. And that's precisely what Ferdi Schutt and his friends have done. Using the appropriate type of ZSM5, a solid acid catalyst, with the right silicon to aluminum ratio, because it's, its acidity, the strength of its acidity, is dependent upon that, you can see, you can go, by dehydrating this, you form acrolein. Acrolein is the stepping stone to all the acrylates and polyacrylates and acrylamides and various other things. So it's an instant, interesting example of how using a nanoporous solid acid catalyst, you can generate worthwhile things. Now, here are three typical solid acid catalysts. This one is used massively. I'll show you a map of the world where various um, commercialized activities involving 
the conversion of methanol to olefins, that's to say to ethylene or propylene or butene, all of which are tremendously, massively used. Think of all the rubbish bins that are made of polyethylene throughout the world. You need tremendous quantities of, poly of, of propylene in order to make that. Sorry, propylene, not ethylene. Silicon aluminum phosphate number 34. It was discovered by the Union Carbide Company 20 years ago. Metal aluminum phosphate number 18, that too. Davy Faraday number four, that was discovered in the Royal Institution. Now all these nice, beautifully crystalline, nanoporous materials, they have micropores of a diameter of about four angstrom units. They can easily convert methanol to a mixture of ethylene, propylene, and butene, more, eth more ethylene, rather less propylene, even less butylene. But it can also be good for the facile dehydration of ethanol at low temperature with almost 100% selectivity. And that, as I was telling you, is the kind of acid that is used extensively industrially in Brazil. Now, here's another example of what I might call shape selectivity. In these microporous materials, certain molecules can enter and lib be liberated, and certain molecules can be formed in the cages and channels, but some big molecules can't even enter. However, what is interesting, you can carry out this acylation or nitration. Now, you need to make explosives, for example, to form a nitro compound. Normally, you'd use a mixture of nitric acid and sulfuric acid, a very aggressive reagent. Here, you use much less aggressive material. You use a mixture of oxygen, N2O4, and no solvent, and you form these nitro compounds. And here, you have paraselectivity because of the shape of this zeolite beta solid acid catalyst. Now, this next slide is prepared by Professor Olsby in the University in Oslo, and she sent it to me less than a week ago. And it's a very striking illustration of how already, since 1986, the Mobil Company went to New Zealand, took natural gas, methane, converted it by partial oxidation to CO and hydrogen, converted that with the methanol synthesis catalyst into methanol, and then using ZSM5, their solid acid catalyst, they convert methanol to gasoline. Well, that's a very expensive way of doing it. And now, in China, for example, you use coal. Now, you can burn coal in a very much cleaner way than you hitherto could. In fact, in Britain at the moment, the engineers are looking afresh at the burning of coal underground. There are three coal mines in the former Soviet Union. In Uzbekistan, there is at least one where the coal is burnt all ent entirely underground. So you can pull up the materials that you wish. And that may well be the engineering challenge of the future if you don't want to burn coal above surface, as it were. But here are all the various um, reactions and uh, activities that are going on. The Topsu company from Denmark takes wood in Central America, burns it again as biomass to CO and hydrogen and CO2, and then uses the methanol synthesis, and then that's timber to gasoline. That's their method. Look, this is on stream already uh, with the hydro company of Norway and uh, the United Oil Products, and they're going to be planning to have uh, methanol to olefin in China coming on stream in 2013. Now, here's an interesting picture. It's an accurate one. It's one that my colleague and I determined 20 years ago. It's lanthanum zeolite Y. There's an anthenum there. The lanthanum is highly polarizing, polarizing cation with a small uh, uh, radius and lots of oxygen in the zeolite in its vicinity, and it binds the solid firmly together. 
Here's an, this is a polyhedral picture, that's an atomic picture. It f clings so tenaciously to the residual water molecule that tends to hydrate these lanthanum ions that in fact it undergoes what is known as cation hydrolysis. So that instead of having Li H2O3+, plus, you have LaOH2+, plus, and a quasi-free proton. That's what confers the solid Brunsted acid catalytic activity on this zeolite Y. And that is the material that, as I was telling you earlier, is used to generate pretty well every uh, liter of gasoline. Now, here's another catalyst which my colleagues and I uh, worked on, and in fact, the British Petroleum Company uh, patented it, and now they produce 450,000 tons per annum in Hull in England of this solvent, ethyl acetate. You might say, well, so what? Ethyl acetate is used in pretty well every computer cartridge, ink cartridge. So it's a massive industry. And notice we discovered this nice reaction. You add acetic acid to ethylene, it's a 100% atom efficient reaction. But I'm sorry to say the catalyst that we invented didn't have the durability. It had no staying power. You can perhaps see more clearly in this Madison Avenue picture of the same color, of the same structure, Montmorillonite. When you dip a clay into some dilute acid, you make it very strongly acidic in the interlamellar region. And that is where this reaction that I talked about occurs. That one there, you see. Now, uh, this is not the catalyst that's used industrially. I don't know what it is, to be honest, but it is a very clean example of technology. A one-step, single reaction, 100% efficient. Now, just to remind ourselves further, there are two categories of nanoporous solids. There are those that are called microporous, that's the UPAC definition. The diameters go up to about 14 angstrom units. Most of those are zeolites or zeolitic or zeotypic materials. There are about 190 of them now, and they still continue to be discovered and new ones for. But they cannot take in big molecules. These are beautifully atomically ordered. I think this picture was taken by Osamu Terasaki, whom I've just seen in the audience when he worked with me in Cambridge. So I'm always pleased to show it. Uh, but this set is mesoporous silica. Now, the Mobile Company made a very interesting discovery in 1992 using liquid crystal templates. This was a touch of mystery, really. They use liquid crystal templates with, in a rich siliceous bath, as it were, and were able to produce beautifully ordered mesoporous silicas. Here they are. This is MCM41, mobile catalytic material number 41. It's so easy to prepare. It takes an hour to prepare. I had a wonderful Spanish postdoc who used to prepare glorious quantities of high purity, high crystalline. But it's crystalline only in the spaces and cages that are there. The walls themselves, as you can prove by silicon NMR, 29 NMR, are amorphous. So it's like a glass which has formed a beautiful vacancy lattice. In fact, in the Arrhenius Laboratory in, in Stockholm, um, many people here, Sven Ledin, who was here, and now uh, Professor Backville, and many others, Zhao Dong, uh, and uh, Zhao, and various other people, are using these solids in a very uh, exciting way as catalysts and as other materials. We've used a lot of uh, MCM41. This is a tomogram, or a section of a tomogram, and I'll come back to that later. Now, don't worry if this looks a little complicated. Just picture a single channel. It's about 30 to 40 angstrom units in diameter. So you can easily sequester an organometallic molecule, like this one, titanosine dichloride. There were very careful 
um, important catalytic reasons why we chose that. Uh, we could then build up a beautiful set of single-site, three-core, well, tripodally anchored, four-coordinated titanium in the four oxidation state. And those are wonderful epoxidation catalysts. Mashmeyer, who uh, worked with me, is now in Australia in chairing the Department of Catalysis and Sustainability in the University of Sydney. I'll mention his work a little later. But we were able to epoxidize in this easy way. Now, here's the active site. Let me just show you. Here's the active site, four coordinated. The hydroperoxide comes in. It gets anchored at the active site. But the reactant doesn't get bonded. It just plucks up an oxygen, and you regenerate. This is catalysis. This is the ely redeal mechanism. Ely was a research student in Cambridge, age 22, when he proposed this mechanism. He's now 94 and very happy that the textbooks are still talking about his work. So it's very different from the langmuir hinshelwood mechanism that applies in the ammonia synthesis where the two reactants have to participate on the surface. Here only one of them gets absorbed. Now, on we go. This group in Milan has done some, in my opinion, extraordinarily beautiful work on fatty acid methyl esters. They epoxidize, using our procedure, uh, tertiary butyl hydroperoxide, and they form these epoxides, which are needed for epoxy resins and various other materials, and it's a way of using the materials that you get from plants and so on. And likewise, these uh, terpene naturally occurring molecules, they are usually characterized by appropriate flavors and fragrances, and they're used extremely ex uh, extensively commercially. Um, they cannot be converted in a zeolitic catalyst, but they can in the mesoporous catalyst. And in fact, the titanium that you use there has bifunctional ability. It can epoxidize, and also it can cause an acid addition. This material, by the way, has got uh, fungicidal activity and is an insect repellent and all sorts of other things. Now, contrast that catalytic reaction with this reaction. Epoxidation is still being used industrially in many parts of the world by using metachloroperbenzoic acid, a reaction that was discovered by this Russian-German gentleman over a hundred years ago. And this is the practice. It's convenient, it's easy, and you just pick up one of the oxygens from the perbenzoic acid and it forms an epoxide, and you generate this byproduct, which of course is a nuisance. Now, <clears throat> very briefly, you can use titanium, as I've shown you, but you can use chromium or vanadium. Molybdenum is a very good catalyst for converting methanol to formaldehyde. I want to mention chromium because there's an Italian worker, Zecchina, who's done some really beautiful work on a very important commercial catalyst, the Philips catalyst, which uses a chromium in the two oxidation state, and it's dipodally attached, and you simply add ethylene, and it forms a huge chain. It's a beautiful industrial example of a single-site heterogeneous catalyst. Well, I don't have time to go into how you can capitalize on the nanospace to carry out asymmetric reactions. Uh, it's described in detail in this re report that appeared uh, four years ago. But all I need to say to you is that you can put the active site in such a position using the appropriate tether that when a prochiral molecule comes in, the enantioselectivity is boosted because of the congestion. That's all I need to say there. Now I must turn to biological catalysis, which is not my field. Frances Arnold is in the audience, and she'll be talking later today. She's done this wonderful work alongside her friend in California, uh, Zhao Liang.
They can take glucose, and by doing Darwinian evolution of enzyme catalysts, which is a fabulously exciting field, she can go from glucose to isobutanol. Isobutanol is a research octane number close to that of gasoline, so it could substitute for gasoline. But she was telling me last night at the dinner that the main use of this material, and it's going commercial, I think you said, Francis, this week, or has already gone commercial last week, and 80 million tons or gallons of this uh, isobutanol can be produced. But what's the other advantage in generating this molecule? You can dehydrate it with a solid acid catalyst, and you get isoprene. So you can get artificial rubber from corn, from glucose, which is a wonderful way of thinking of sustainability. Here's another speaker in this symposium, Kiesling. I was very struck by this. Switchgrass, which grows to human or excessive human height, and uh, miscanthus and various other types of, of grasses. By playing tunes and engineering your Escherichia coli appropriately, you can in fact convert this switchgrass, depending on how dexterously you play the game, to either ordinary fuel, or diesel fuel, or jet fuel. All those are described in that wonderful paper. There's a group in Wisconsin led by Jim Domesic, who has done, that has done very excellent work in sustainability. Here's one of the things that they've done in the last four years or so. Glycerol, our old friend again, and water. They pass it through a catalyst which produces syngas, a mixture of hydrogen and CO. And then they have another catalyst, which I don't have time to go into detail on, a Fischer-Tropsch catalyst, discovered in Germany in 1914, responsible for a massive amount of generation of hydrocarbons and alcohols and so forth, and you get liquid fuels. Here's a better picture of it. It's from that journal. Glycerol, you convert it to syngas, Fischer-Tropsch catalyst, you get liquid, and that's it. And one is exothermic, and one is endothermic, so it's thermally neutral. So it's a very beautiful reaction. Here's another example of domestic's work, which I think is impressive. Production of dimethylfurin for liquid fuels from biomass-derived carbohydrates. This is how he goes, you see. And there are dehydration catalysts, which are things like ZSM5. There's hydrogenolysis catalysts, which uses a metal. And then you end up with these particular molecules. And here, here are the research octane numbers. There's much to be learnt by pursuing this line, which at present is not commercially viable. But sooner or later, there will be new catalysts, better catalysts, and more efficient ways of doing these things. Marshmeyer gave me a copy of this. He was in Cambridge a few weeks ago. He has now produced a catalytic hydrothermal reactor which takes sawdust and converts it in a matter of hours to what he calls biofuel, bio-crude. You don't have oil from the ground, as it were. You get it from trees using this catalytic process. It's rapidly becoming commercial. You know, the European Union said a few years ago that by 2030, all fuel would have to be of bio-source. Well, many people are skeptical about that because you don't have enough land for grass and corn and various other things for bioethanol. But if you can use the trees that are in Canada and in Australia and in Sweden in superabundance, and you can, as, it, as it's called in the world, a drop-in process. That means to say you can use the infrastructure that has been developed and refined uh, for oil using uh, sawdust as a raw material. Now, if I go on, look, this lower olefins, that's to say C, ethylene, propylene, butene, etc., are key building blocks in the manufacture of plastics, cosmetics, and drugs, etc. Now, this work has come from Utrecht. It's very nice work. They're working on new catalysts for doing that. 
But the BASF company is taking a completely fresh look. Natural gas, coal, or biomass. You can either go the methanol route to MTO, methanol to olefins, methanol to uh, polymers, or you go directly by playing tunes and dexterously modifying the catalyst so as to achieve just olefinic products. This is what this group has done. Uh, it's a long way to go, but they can concentrate on getting C2 to C4 olefins with a sele selectivity of 60% by weight. Not enough, but very promising. Now, in the very last part of my talk, I want to talk about nanoclusters. And I distinguish between nanoclusters and nanoparticles. Nanoparticles, 5 to 10 nanometers in diameter, contain hundreds of millions of atoms. So the energy levels in such particles are pretty well continuous. Even in a platinum 309 cluster that forms a nanoparticle, you have a continuous energy level. This calculation was done by Henrik Gronbeck in Gothenburg in Chalmers, with whom I've been collaborating, by the way. Platinum-3, on the other hand, has distinct energy levels. It's more like a molecule. Now, in Cambridge, over many years, with Brian Johnson, we've been doing some chemistry using nanoclusters, where we have no more than about 30 atoms. Now, the reason why we do that is because their energy levels are higher. They're more catalytically active, you know, in cutting a long story short. They donate and abstract electrons more readily than nanoparticles. Now, here's where I want to show you. You can take muconic acid, which was made in Michigan State University, from corn, and you can convert it using this catalyst that uh, we devised in Cambridge. And here it is in this nanoporous, mesoporous material. Now, I hope this works, first of all. Ah, yes, it will. Now, we take slices through this nanoporous silica every 10 angstrom units, and we go on a little journey. Uh, I hope the journey will, doesn't seem to be starting. <laughs> Let me just try it again. Isn't it funny, Magnus? It worked when we did when we tried it before. <laughs> No, I think, oh, no, yes it is. Now, on computer, we've taken out those nanoparticles. Now we're going to go down on a journey, 10 angstrom units at a time, unless it needs another kick, which it might. I'm running into injury time, Mr. Chairman. I hope you will allow me. I'm very nearly finished. Well, I better leave that. Look, a very clever piece of work in Tufts University reported in science a couple of weeks ago. When you have plat palladium, hydrogen dissociates gradually, but it, the hydrogen atoms get stuck on the surface rather too tenaciously. When you put a copper surface, the hydrogen doesn't dissociate very readily. There's a huge potential barrier. If, however, you put one palladium atom on a copper, there's a rapid dissociation, there's a spillover, and then it migrates over the surface, and it's a very efficient catalyst. Single atom alloy, this is what they call it. It's very beautiful. Now, I want to end, Mr. Chairman, by giving you two quick examples of where dirty, ecologically and environmentally aggressive processes can be clearly replaced by clean ones. Here's the way in which nylon-6 is prepared. You have to start either with cyclohexanone, which you get from oil, or, or benzene and cyclohexane. You go through an oxime. Then there's a Beckman rearrangement, which gives you caprolactam. You heat it, and this is nylon-6. Now, here are the ways in which various industries have produced this very important oxime, very aggressive, nitrog nitric acid, nit nitrogen chloride. Now, here's 
the way in which the Rashig process, which is the most extensively used one, hydroxylamine sulfate it forms this, you need oleum, then you have that, then you isomerize it, and you generate a huge quantity, almost four times as much ammonium sulfate as you do of the caprolactam, which is the nylon. Here's the method that we evolved, in which we use a bifunctional catalyst. We have a redox center and an acid center, and you can do that in one single step, solvent-free. That's, those are the advantages of nylon. You couldn't run any hospital without nylon-6. You need it for a multiplicity of purposes. Now, here's another example. Nicotinic acid is another name for niacin, a vitamin. But you wouldn't call it nicotinic acid. People would think that you are talking about nicotine, right? Because you can convert nicotine to nicotinic acid. Industrially, there are two methods. This is one method. You use chromic oxide. Look at, look at all the mess that you generate. Or you can use permanganate, not quite as big a mess, but still very inappropriate. The commercial method at the moment uses selenium dioxide. But we were able to work out in Cambridge, Raja and Stephen Lay and myself, a very nice nanoporous catalyst which does this in one step using this manganese aluminium phosphate number five, and you do that in one step. Now, here is an example where by putting titanium, two atoms of titanium, in four coordination, in the four oxidation state, you can start with cyclohexene, go to the epoxide, the dihydroxide, to the anhydrous, and end up with a dipic acid. Now, this is a slow process, but that is environmentally a clean one, and it's sequential. Now, I end, and I end in one minute, Mr. Chairman, no more, by simply saying that, of course, the big challenge, and I'm not equipped to discuss it, is to harness solar energy. Ferdi Schutt, again, has given me the map of Germany on the Sahara there, and there's so much energy that we could capture by carrying out reactions of that kind. And going back to the very first pyrotechnic lecture this morning, I have to mention that in Cambridge, Massachusetts, this gentleman, Nocera, has indeed produced a wireless solar water splitting using silicon-based semiconductor and earth-abundant catalysts. And indeed, he can run a 100-watt bulb using such a cell. With that, Mr. Chairman, I end. Thank you for your attention.